like to welcome you out to our webinar about how currency dealers work. It's Monday, January 19th, and I am Rob Booker, and I'm joined by my associate and friend, Justin Hertzberg from Forest Park FX. Hi, Justin. Hey, Rob. Good, good evening, everyone. If you're joining us live, you know that there have been some recent events in the world of Forex and the world of brokers that are it's unprecedented, and we'd like to spend some time tonight talking about that, and then also talking about where you turn for answers and and how you can follow up with us to get more information. Everybody's telling me to say hello to Justin, so right. hello to Justin. Uh, first, I want to begin the presentation with my condolences and my deeply felt regret and uh, sadness for any of you that lost any amount of money when the Swiss National Bank removed its floor on the Euro Swiss franc last week. I know that affected some of you, and I just want to say that um, that was nothing less than a, than a financial tragedy to some of you, and I just want to say that uh, I feel really badly for you, and I've been in a position before where circumstances outside my control took money away from me. I, Justin, I told the story just a couple of times before, but back in 2004, I was trading the dollar Japanese yen, and I was selling the dollar yen, and the Ministry of Finance in Japan stepped in and intervened, and I took my largest single loss in currency trading. I took a $50,000 loss. It wasn't exactly 50000 I wish it was a round number, but uh, I took a $50,000 loss, and I could not even say the word Japan. <laughs> for some time. I, I was traumatized by that, that it was all gone in an instant. And um, so I, I, do, I do kind of know how it feels to have to gain back. That was a substantial amount of my equity at the time, a lot of the money that I had worked very hard to build up over time. And I, I just want to say, and I'm sure, Justin, you, you share that sentiment, that we're just sorry that that happened to a lot of you. Yeah, it uh, it was devastating. Uh, we had a few clients that were impacted, and uh, it's it's a sickening and helpless feeling. And uh, you really don't know what to tell someone who's been on the other end of that. Um, but uh, we, you know, we'll kind of get into exactly what happened, and 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 maybe maybe help find a way to to put and articulate those feelings, and uh, and and talk about you know what next and and what to do from here. All right, so we're very happy to see you here. We know many of you are watching this presentation as a recording, and we welcome you as well. Uh, I am Rob. For those of you that don't know me, I've been trading currency for 14 years. I was a terrible trader when I started out. Uh, I got involved in the carry trade in the mid-2000s, made a lot of money uh, doing the carry trade, uh, built trading systems when the carry trade was sort of turned off and uh, created a counter-trend trading system that I call Trifecta. And uh, I'm joined by Justin, founder and CEO of Forest Park FX. Forest Park FX is an introducing broker that helps to lower the transaction costs for traders who trade FX. I'd like to read a risk disclaimer, at least part of it, and I want to make sure that you know that currency trading is not suitable for everyone and does present the risk of substantial loss. I want to make sure that you all know that. And before deciding to participate in the Forex market, you should carefully consider your investment objectives, your level of experience, and your risk appetite. Most importantly, do not invest money that you cannot afford to lose. There is considerable exposure to risk in any off-exchange, foreign exchange transaction, including but not limited to leverage, credit worthiness, limited regulatory protection, and market volatility that may substantially affect the price or liquidity of a currency or currency pair. Moreover, the leveraged nature of Forex trading means that any market movement will have an equally proportional effect on your deposited funds. This may work for you as well as against you. And the possibility does exist that you could sustain a total loss of initial margin funds and in some cases be required to deposit additional funds to maintain your position. This webinar presentation is live on Monday, January 19th. I am in the Arizona time zone. Justin's joining us from the Eastern U.S. time zone and we welcome you here. What I'd like to make sure that you know is that uh, my good friend Justin uh, has a JD, as, as do I actually, which I never used, a law degree, practiced as a securities and commercial litigator, was a trader and in-house counsel for several brokerage firms, 
launched Forest Park FX in March of 2013, and Forest Park FX is a CFTC-registered NFA member introducing brokerage firm. Uh, I want to start the presentation off tonight with just a, a brief reminder and or description, Justin, of exactly what happened when the Swiss National Bank uh, made its decision and what happened. And if you don't mind, I've got, I've got the slide ready for you, and I'd just like to turn a moment over to you. All right, Justin, the Swiss National Bank announcement. Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, quite a bit of fireworks last week, and um, questions here. And um, Rob, you can see the questions that come through from any of the people listening. Yeah. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time because I do want to answer questions, and uh, this is a very sensitive subject for a lot of people. You got it. But um, just as a, as a brief recap, to, to kind of add a little bit of color to what happened last week, in 2011, the Swiss National Bank made a monetary policy decision to cap the francs appreciation to the euro. And one of the key reasons that they did it with the euro in particular is that given their geographic location uh, and the Swiss uh, economy as a uh, strong exporter of goods, um, they wanted to peg their currency um, to the currency that was more or less their consumer, which was the eurozone. And um, by basically capping the appreciation of the franc, they could make their exports affordable to the eurozone. Um, and if the appreciation of the franc grew to an extent where European consumers could buy goods from other countries, then they would start to buy from other countries outside of Swiss. Um, and this, this, this cap on appreciation, or this 120 floor in the euro-Swiss, uh, was in place for a little over three years. And uh, as everyone is now kind of gathered on the 15th, Thursday of last week, without any notice, the Swiss National Bank removed the cap and allowed the Swiss franc to appreciate according to natural supply and demand forces. And this was news that was unexpected um, and unprecedented in the fact that there was no step-down approach, nothing that said we're going to go from 120 to 119 or we're going to go from 120 to 118. They simply removed all restriction on the franc's appreciation relative to the euro. And within moments, literally moments, uh, euro-swiss gapped down from 120 to about 103. Um, Dollar-swiss had a gap down of about 28 uh, big figures. Um, and Rob, you can go back one more there a moment just to the before picture. You can kind of get an, an image of what the Euro Swiss looked like. And these are 15 minute bars going back a couple days. And the market was basically in a six pip range right near the floor. And the moment that that news came out, that floor evaporated. And the market found a new equilibrium um, way down at the 103 area. And, uh, Rob, you can flip forward to that, and the 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 chart um, on the next slide, Rob, tells yeah. a really interesting story because we all look at charts and we see we see bars, we see candles, we see a natural progression up or down, uh, oftentimes in a random walk pattern, um, and then you look at a chart like this, and there is literally nothing between 120 and 103. And um, if you were caught in the wake of this, if you had any Swiss exposure, you had a either profoundly positive day or a catastrophically horrible day. Um, and uh, that is an image that for some of the people on this webinar, for several of my clients, they will remember for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, it begs the question, where did all the liquidity go? Um, and I actually read a really interesting article on this that um, analyzed from a statistical perspective the likelihood 
of ever seeing another currency pair deviate the way that this one did uh, in as short a time frame as it, as it did. Uh, and the calculation came out to be that this is likely to reoccur once every billion years. That is how great of a black swan type event this was. Uh, and so, okay, so we have a black swan. We accept that this is something that the world has never seen before. Well, what does it mean? What, what was the consequence of this announcement? And what we have to remember is that the FX market is not just about give me the best spread or you slip me half a point here or there. The FX market is a marketplace with buyers and sellers. And the sellers or the liquidity providers are typically banks, brokerages, um, which have an army of people and an army of computers that are running algorithms and programs and measuring their inventory of one currency relative to another and where they think it's going and measures of risk and so on. And these algorithms that they use are very, very sensitive. They're sensitive to slight movements and changes in the market and they adjust in nanoseconds. Well, when you have a bit of news like this, it literally breaks the machine in a sense. The algorithms can't compute what a fair market for this pair is, or any, any pair involving the Swiss is. And as a result, the liquidity providers and their programs pull away. They shut off. They turn off their liquidity. They're no longer quoting. And what happens is the liquidity disappears. If no one is willing to sell you, to quote you Euro Swiss, Dollar Swiss, CAD Swiss, whatever, there is no market. It's as if you walked into a Ford dealership and there was no one to sell you Fords. Well, as much as you might want to buy, there's no one there willing to sell it to you. And um, that is essentially what happened here. Um, there was no one in these banks and brokerages that knew how to quote Swiss in the wake of this news. And until enough data had been processed, enough time had passed, was there any liquidity be, to be found? And if some people on this call had positions at FXCM, for example, and you might have even had a stop loss in one of these pairs, and that stop loss would have been triggered, but your order might not have been filled for about four hours. Can you imagine that? That for four hours, FXCM couldn't find someone on the other side of your trade? But that is essentially what happened here. Uh, and uh, it had, like I said, profound impact on the market, on traders, on brokers. And uh, we'll kind of get into uh, to that now a little bit. Um, Rob, if you don't mind just flipping ahead uh, two slides. So this is just a little graphic which uh, kind of explains exactly what uh, traders were feeling when they woke up Thursday morning. Uh, if you had Swiss exposure, there was no muted or in-between feeling. This was a binary outcome. And uh, to put it crudely, you either woke up rich or woke up broke. And um, for those that had short Swiss exposure, not only did you likely wake up with zero dollars in your trading account, but you more than likely had a negative balance or what's called a debit balance, meaning that you lost more money than you actually had on deposit with that broker. And uh, there are a lot of questions around that. Uh, and Rob, if you want to flip to the next slide. Yeah, sure. We'll kind of talk about what a debit balance means. Um, and, and just to give you the definition again, you now owe your broker more money as you lost more than you had on deposit. So if you had a $10,000 account, as a result of this trade and the fact that your stop loss, when it finally got executed, your account might be negative $30,000, for example. And from a general standpoint, you are more or less responsible for that $30,000 to your broker. Now, that said, most retail brokers have language in their customer agreements that state that clients are not responsible or liable for debit balances. So if you had a negative $30,000 in your account, 
the broker is basically going to zero that out. And they're going to say, well, you know, we're not going to come after you for the $30,000. Um, now they may decide that they don't want you as a customer anymore, or if you put up money towards uh, refunding your account, that they're going to seize that money. But if you just walk away from the situation, they'll let you walk away. Um, now others have language in their trader agreements or customer agreements that leave open some room for interpretation. Um, I'm not going to get into what specific language you should or should be looking for or what language means one thing versus another, but if someone has uh, any questions about that, feel free to email me or call me. I'm happy to uh, review your specific trader agreement and, and assess what I think the likelihood is that you might have uh, some liability for a debit balance. Um, but, but practically speaking, it's unlikely that your broker will pursue a debit balance against you. And um, for those uh, clients with certain brokers, perhaps um, OANDA or DirectFX or FinFX or lots of places, they've already come out and sent emails saying uh, that something to the effect of we stand behind our clients, we will not be pursuing any debit balances, and uh, it's business as usual. Uh, other firms have not yet come out with that. Perhaps they're trying to figure out what their full exposure is, what they want to do going forward, but um, it would be a very difficult uh, undertaking for a broker to go after each and every one of its clients in a legal action. Yeah, uh, I, so I want to second that for those of you that are worried or have friends that are thinking about it. I, I worked at a broker in 2008. I was the chief market strategist at Interbank FX. And on Sunday nights in 2008 and early 2009, traders would, on Sunday nights, watch the market gap open 500 to 1,000 pips in the pound yen. And I remember being at Interbank FX when they made the internal decisions to let go of that client debt or whatnot. And most brokers are going to make that same decision. And, of course, there can be no guarantees made about that. But for most of you and your friends – and our friends in this business, you don't have something to worry about. The reason you have a negative balance is that imagine or imagine someone out there trading the euro Swiss franc and their stop loss, let's say if it falls 1,000 pips that would use up all of their usable margin and their account would go to zero, literally th there was no price quoted at that level. It, it had to fall another full 1,000 points before there was any even quote given. So theoretically, they were, got, they were stopped out of the trade when the floor had dropped out of their trading account. If you are a bank yeah. trading with another bank, you owe that other bank money. But as a currency trader in the retail space, you don't necessarily owe the broker any money. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, you know, when you trade on the institutional side of the world, uh, you have a lot greater access, you have a lot more information, you have a lot of uh, market depth and, and tools that a retail trader doesn't have, but you're also treated like an institution, and institutions are liable for their debts. Um, when you trade on the retail space, it's a trade-off. You, you give up access to certain information, you take what the broker gives, you, you use the liquidity that the broker offers, and um, in exchange, the broker is supposed to protect you because you're not an institution, because you're, you're a regular Joe. You're a, you're a dabbler. You're a guy who's got another profession, and he trades because he's interested or he wants to learn the market. Yeah. And uh, it's, it should be their job to protect you, and they're supposed to build systems to do that. Right. And, and if those systems break down and you incur a debit balance, they're not supposed to go after you. Exactly. Um, exactly. And Phil brings up a good question. Hi, Phil. And Phil's comment was, wouldn't this, wouldn't this be more of a problem? This whole situation is more of a problem for a broker that perhaps didn't have a dealing desk. Would you, would you agree with that, Justin? Or yeah, and and we're going to get into that. Um, one thing I before we do, and and, and I want to address Phil's question because it's a very uh, poignant one for this for the time that we're in right now. Um, but just one thing, and and Rob, I'm sure your your listeners are very well educated as a function of all of your webinars, but I just want to reiterate that stop losses are not 
guarantees of the price at which you get stopped out. A stop loss is nothing more than a threshold. And when that threshold is crossed, your stop loss order simply becomes a market order. And that market order will get executed at the next available market price. And that might be at the price of your stop loss. It might be a pip better. It might be a pip worse. But in the case of what happened on Thursday, it could be a thousand pips worse. It could be two thousand pips worse. And uh, and that's what happened. Um, but it's uh, it's unlikely that anyone with a debit balance is going to have their broker come after them. Um, like you said, Rob, there are no guarantees. But practically speaking, it's it's bad from a reputational perspective, and it's almost uh, unmanageable from an administrative and legal perspective to actually do it. Yeah. Uh, and and hopefully we don't see any brokers going after their clients. Uh, yeah, but, I uh, do, and it is unlikely that we'll see any of that. But a lot of great, a lot of great questions. Um, my friend Randy says, for most of us small traders, the broker normally takes the other side of our trade, correct? And that is true. And in that instance, it was simply essentially a side bet between you and the broker. You, you know, in some cases, you lost and the broker won. The broker took your account and doesn't want to rub salt into the wound. Um, and that's, that's, that's what, when I was at Interbank FX, and I know this, you would expect me to say something like this, but I... I sat in meetings where management considered legal action against clients, and I watched the management simply refuse to treat the customers like that. And it was a, it was a bright moment in, in my experience with brokers, which generally have a terrible reputation. And this, this could be another one of those instances where essentially brokers who have lost a lot of money. There are some non-dealing desk brokers who lost hundreds of millions of dollars and they yeah, and, and let's let's talk about that yeah before we get into the 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 dealing desk non-dealing desk situation because okay. it, it will lead in um okay and i think get some light on on phil's question and some of the others um do you mind flipping uh forward one slide rob absolutely not here we go Okay, so we're gonna we're trying to go through this, and, and when I prepared this, I wanted to to go through this in sort of a pragmatic way to explain what happened on Thursday and how it's impacted the market participants. Market participants being you and your brokers. Um, and so I kind of want to go through a little bit about what does a debit balance mean to your broker. Now, sort of on on Phil's question, um, and and we'll just give a quick thirty second overview of the difference between dealing desk and non-dealing desk. Uh, a dealing desk broker means that your broker is essentially the counterparty to every trade that you place. If you buy the euro dollar, they sold you the euro dollar. If you sell dollar yen, they bought the dollar yen from you. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a two-person equation. Um, that's it. You have you on one side, the broker on the other side. But when you deal with a non-dealing desk broker, your broker is actually just sitting in the middle as sort of a facilitator of order flow. And on the one side, they have you, the trader, and on the other side, they might have 10, 15, 20 different banks and other brokers. Um, and they're receiving quotes from all of those brokers and banks, and they're aggregating them to show you the best bid and the best offer. And when you trade, when you go out and buy dollar yen, they don't no, it, it, they're not directing that to any one particular uh, bank or brokerage, but you are getting the best offer in dollar yen at that moment in time. And it might be with, with bank number two. And when you go to sell that position, it might be with bank number five. Uh, and your broker, let's say in this example is FXCM. FXCM is just sitting in the middle, and they are facilitating your order flow with all of the different liquidity providers that are out there. And FXCM doesn't have a hand or a, uh, a vested interest in your profitability. Um, they are indifferent to your making or losing money. They just make money on transaction volume. Um, so going back to the bullets here, um, with a non-dealing desk broker, the counterparty to your trade is often a bank or brokerage on the other side that's unknown to you at the time. It might be Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan. Um, it might be some other larger brokerage that you don't know. But you're, but they're anonymous to you. 
And here's the interesting thing. The bank or brokerage that's selling you the dollar yen doesn't know you specifically either. They don't know that this is Rob Booker's account or Justin Hertzberg's account. What they see is they see an order coming from FXCM. And you trade under the FXCM umbrella. And all of their clients trade under that umbrella. So all of those FXCM clients put in orders, buy and sell all day long. And to those counterparties on the other side, they're just trading with FXCM. And it's that process that created the issue for FXCM and Alpari and Excel Markets and several others. Because here's what happened on Thursday. If you as the trader lose more money than you have in your account, FXCM is doing those trades with, its, with all of the different liquidity providers in their name. So guess what? If your account goes negative $30,000, FXCM has to pay that $30,000 to the liquidity providers on the other side of that transaction. And either they can choose to come after you for the $30,000 they lost, or they're just out that money. And that's essentially what happened with, with these three brokers here and with a number of others, is that FXCM's clients had debit balances in excess of $225 million on the day. And FXCM has to make good on that money to all of the different liquidity providers that it deals with. So all of a sudden, FXCM is out $225 million, and all they have is an IOU from their clients, essentially. And that's essentially what put their firm at risk. That's what caused Alpari to file for insolvency in the UK. And that's what caused Excel Markets to simply close its doors. That the losses sustained by their clients were ultimately borne by the broker itself when paying its counterparties. And, uh, and that is the real, one of the, one of the truest and most profound risks that a dealing desk in the retail FX space encounters. Um, they typically have a no risk, hands off approach. But guess what? If, if what happened on Thursday happens, then all their clients lose money. They have to make good on their clients' losses. And that's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary circumstance that, in, in this sense, brokers who we spend a lot of time making fun of or accusing of all kinds of disgustingly horrible things, in some of these cases, the broker is essentially going to either cover your losses or declare insolvency so that you don't have to cover your losses. Like literally, that is, I'm not saying that's kind of what's happening. That's, that's essentially what these brokers are, are grappling with is this problem. And um, I know that some of you think it's kind of poetic justice that a broker ends up, you know, like in the same problem that you've been put in before. So um, in any yeah, case. But, so, you know, you, gotta, you have to be careful not to necessarily wish that on anyone yeah. because if that were happening <coughs> to your broker and your broker wasn't um, honest, straightforward, or in a, a developed jurisdiction, um, they could decide, well, they're going to file for bankruptcy, but guess what? What if you were on the winning side of that trade? Or what if you were sleeping and you had absolutely no exposure whatsoever and you just have money sitting there? Well, if they disappear with your money, you know, that's also a bad situation. Right, and which is why you want to trade with a broker that's large, hopefully right. publicly traded, has access to the capital markets. It's why trading with FXCM was good and bad. FXCM's business model couldn't keep up with the, 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 the situation on Thursday morning, but FXCM's financial strength and reputation for paying its bills on time. You don't ever doubt Drew Niv, who is the founder and CEO of FXCM. You just don't doubt the man. The man is, and he is, he does not, he does not give up. And they found a way. They have access to, find, you know, financial uh, resources that other smaller brokers do not. You can't plan on your broker never having a problem, but you can certainly trade with a broker that's that's the right fit for you. And that's, that's why Justin is here, is because that's what Justin does for a living. Yeah, and, and um, you know, 
with Rob, I'll talk a little bit about dealing desks now and, and the difference. So, you know, that what happened, and, and these firms that you're seeing below are, are non-dealing desk firms, or straight through processing firms, whatever language or uh, vernacular you want to use. Interestingly enough, the dealing desk firms out there um, performed the best uh, in this crisis. And the reason is, is that the liquidity that needed to be there to execute orders, long or short, uh, Swiss during uh, this crisis uh, was provided by your dealing desk. They're the only counterparty. They're the only one that you deal with. And uh, essentially, the dealing desks have risk profiles and parameters in place to largely prevent against clients from going debit balance. And they, you might have gone to zero. You might have even incurred maybe a small debit balance, but nothing of the magnitude that uh, some of the other firms, some of the non-dealing desk firms, encounter. Right. And uh, you know, there's there's always been a great rivalry between FXCM and Forex.com uh, over the years, especially within the U.S. And uh, the the fundamental differences between the two are never better illustrated than on Thursday where FXCM lost $225 million in client assets and Gain Capital or Forex.com turned a profit. Yeah, they made money because, think about it, when, when FXCM clients lost money on Thursday morning, some bank on the other side, as you can see on my screen, some bank wins. When clients of Gain Capital lost on Thursday, Gain Capital won. That means that that means that Gain Capital could immediately say, we're not taking, we're not going to chase after you for a negative account balance. We already just got your entire account. They don't need, they don't need any more of it. That's why Oanda and Gain, they did quite well on that day. And it's not to say that Gain is smart and FXCM is dumb. That's an oversimplification of the issue. But it is to say that not every broker is right for every trader. Right, and uh, and there are, there are lots of factors to look at uh, in choosing a broker, and it's not just about <clears throat> price, but sometimes it's about execution, technology, service, reliability, stability, um, execution model. Um, you know, how much does it matter to you to be able to sleep at night, going, uh, my funds are segregated, or my funds are FDIC insured, or uh, my account's never going below zero. Uh, those are the types of questions that everyone needs to ask themselves in trying to find a brokerage solution that suits them, suits their risk tolerance and their trading strategy. Um, and and not every broker is right for every trader. Um, it's one of the first things that we say when we talk to a client and we kind of go through this dialogue or question and answer processes. You know, how can we help you arrive at the type of trader you are and what type of risk tolerance you have to find the best fit. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing I do want to reiterate, because we've, I mean, my firm especially, we've fielded probably 50, 60 questions from clients on, on FXCM alone is, you know, should I be pulling my money out of FXCM? Can I trust them? Um, the the capital injection that they got on Friday from Jefferies um, was not a surprise because historically FXCM is an extremely profitable broker, extremely reliable broker. They are perhaps the largest FX retail broker in the world. And what happened on Thursday, like I said, was a once in a billion years event statistically. The likelihood of this happening again is remote. The likelihood of it happening again and FXCM being as ill-equipped to deal with it from a liquidity standpoint is even more remote. And the fact that FXCM is now back in compliance with uh, its liquidity providers, back in compliance with regulators, <coughs> we can all rest comfortably knowing that it's business as usual. And for those clients who been up at night thinking, I don't know what to do with my money, it's there, do I have to get it out, should I close all trades? At this point, you should feel as comfortable as you did on Wednesday night. In fact, you should probably feel more comfortable because what happened on Thursday 
in terms of the magnitude of the event and the way FXCM handled it is likely to never happen again. And um, if you are there, you can continue to trade with confidence. Um, if you are thinking about it or hold your money, um, maybe maybe you don't want to be with them, but uh, we see no risk in uh, remaining an FXCM customer. And, uh, Frankly, you should trade with confidence there again. Yeah, there's no question in my mind either. I've known them for a long time. Um, okay, so th this has been – everybody, so far, are you getting some answers? Uh, how's that going for everybody? You, are you, you, you appreciate what um, Justin's got here for you? It has been really great. I've really enjoyed this conversation so far. Um, really have enjoyed this. There's, of course, there's a lot of unanswered questions that are at this point unanswerable. Like, what someone asked me today, what's going to happen next? <laughs> and I said, the likely things to happen next are, are not this. This is not what's likely to happen next. There'll be other external causes of much volatility in 2015, which will be the subject of another and different webinar. So, um, Anything else you want to say about this, Justin, before we move on to how traders here can get more answers from you specifically about their individual situation? Yeah, actually, I'll just I'll just spend about a minute on on sort of what's next in terms of what can we expect as the the ripple effects of this um, this event from last week, <laughs> and a couple things. One is this was a great example of how interconnected the world and the financial markets are. So the Swiss National Bank makes a decision and it sends shockwaves throughout the world causing billion dollar firms to possibly go under, causing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue to be lost. And um, there's, a, there's a consensus out there that this decision was very irresponsible. That Central banks need to consider not just their own immediate economy and economic needs, but the ripple effect that it will have on the world. And I think that we won't see an announcement of this magnitude um, probably for another generation or two, um, for one. Uh, I also think that from a regulatory standpoint, we're going to see renewed conversations about leverage, uh, about um, debit balances, how firms are handling them, about risk controls that firms are putting in place, about certain mandatory requirements or limits on liquidity that firms have to have. I think we're going to see a lot of things about that um, in the coming 6 to 12 months. Um, and, uh, and But but hopefully uh, this is, like I said, a, a once in a billion year thing. And, uh, we, we go back to business as usual. Most right. firms are business as usual these days. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, and Justin, when the Chinese yuan uh, experiences some kind of revaluation, which will come, that will definitely affect the Japanese yen. But I can, I can certainly speculate with a, a fair degree of certainty that it's not going to go down like this. And uh, we've been talking about that for years. And it's nobody here is trading the Chinese currency. Nobody here is doing that. So um, have you, you don't have exposure to the Chinese currency, and most of you don't have exposure to the Singapore dollar, and most of you don't have exposure to the Hong Kong dollar. Don't trade any of those. Don't ever get involved in any of that stuff. And if, as long as you do that, you're going to be safer. Keep your trade size small. Um, talk to Justin about the type of trading you do, and make sure you're at a broker that is more likely to be able to sustain that type of situation. And a lot of traders are asking, well, how could, how could traders prevent from being in this kind of a situation? And the, the, the only answer is not a satisfactory one at this point. And it is don't, sit on, don't ever sit on top of what is proposed to be a guaranteed trade ever again. That's what happened here. Traders had huge position sizes on what they assumed to be a central bank floor. Don't ever, don't ever do anything like that. The, the, the biggest lesson here is there is no easy money and don't ever take a position size that assumes that such a thing exists. None of you here are responsible for what happened and the Swiss National Bank was, did a highly irregular and irresponsible thing. 
for which there is little to no recourse for the average investor. However, going forward, the best things that you can do, don't trade currencies with pegs like the Chinese yuan or the Hong Kong dollar. Don't trade those. Number two, don't hold large positions or highly leveraged positions for long periods of time in what is referred to you as a guaranteed win or anything of the sort. And the next thing is keep your trade size reasonably small and don't, don't trade with a lot of leverage. And th those, are not, those are not great answers, but so far those are the only ones that we have. And as time goes on, we will certainly present to you as much information as we can about what you can do in the future to protect yourself. Yeah, it's very well said, Rob. Um, and uh, I think whether you are affected or not affected, uh, this is a lesson to, to take to heart and make sure that uh, either you don't repeat it or you don't get caught up in it um, when it happens with another currency pair. And that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's the whole, you know, the, the, the biggest takeaway that, uh, that, that your webinars often give. It's, you know, learn from other people's mistakes, um, you know, leverage the experience of others and, uh, and try not to, uh, Try not to make their mistakes. Try not to um, dig yourself a hole, but uh, use the the information that you're receiving here as a as a tool to ascend your own learning curve a little bit faster. Uh, and uh, that's yeah, it's, it's, it's just a good point. Now, a lot of you have additional questions about your specific situations, and Justin, I, this is as good of a time as any to make sure that they know. Um, they, they know some final things about what they should know about their broker and what they should know about you. Yeah, so, so look, with, with, with brokers, as I said, it's not, you know, every, every trader has their own sort of unique package and not every broker is the right fit for every trader. Um, and you want to know your broker's policies, their liquidity, stability, reliability, what service offerings they have, platforms they offer, technology packages, uh, rebate policies with your introducing broker. All of these things sort of fill out a matrix, and you want to find the right fit for you based upon that matrix. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, and we can help you sort of navigate that uh, for you. Um, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to do all the research. You can engage in a conversation. Tell us who you are, what you're looking for, where you've been, what your experience is, and we will try to help you find that right fit um, for you. Um, you know, the, the what do I do now dealing desk versus non-dealing desk. This is going to be the most uh, asked question that we're going to get for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, the dealing desks clearly handle financial crises better than non-dealing desks. Um, Gain capital, made money. XCM lost $225 million. Um, that's great. Forex.com is right now probably the most reliable broker in the world based upon how it handled the, the black swan of this industry. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're right for you. Um, certainly worth a look. Certainly part of the conversation and up for consideration, but you may still be best served with a non-dealing desk. It just depends, and you have to engage in that conversation and that dialogue to find out where um, where the right broker is, um, who the right broker is. <coughs> um, one thing that, uh, that we do in addition to trying to help traders uh, find the right broker, help to answer their questions, help to guide them, uh, is we offer cash back rebates uh, with pretty much every broker we work with in the U.S. and uh, uh, some non-U.S. brokers through our non-U.S. entity. Um, and I've listed a couple of them here. Um, you know, one of the things that we do as a core tenant of our business is we try to make your trading more cost effective. We try to make your trading smarter. We try to put you in a position to succeed. And uh, one of the most tangible ways that we can do that is offering you a cash back rebate. Uh, we will essentially make it cheaper for you to trade through us with one of our brokers than by going direct to that broker. Um, and in fact, we don't have any clients where we don't actually add value uh, to what they're doing. I, 
I want to go to sleep at night knowing I did right by my clients, and this is one of the ways that I can say, yeah, uh, at a bare minimum, I've reduced your forex.com cost of trading by half a pip on every round turn, or yeah. by two tenths of a pip on every round turn at Oanda. I mean, the reason I work with Justin is, and many of you know this already, and for the rest of you, it's going to sound like I'm. I'm a total, like, this is not going to sound legitimate, but listen, the, I do a lot of stuff for free like this webinar, and I do a lot of presentations at no charge. I dearly care about traders, and I have made every mistake. I have worked with brokers who are dishonest. I have gotten caught in bad trades. Justin's been on the inside and on both sides, and what Justin does now is, without changing your spreads, Justin will hook you up with a broker that is going to fit your needs as a trader for the trade size that you're going to take. And then you're going to, whatever, there's money always going to your broker in that spread. And Justin is going to return some of that that would ordinarily just go to the broker. He's going to return that to you. And that sounds ridiculous, but those spreads and commissions are markups on trades that brokers have built into the price of a trade so that they can rebate or pay introducing brokers like Justin. What Justin does is he turns around and he gives you back a substantial portion, a majority portion of that rebate. It's, it, it, there's not anything else like this in the business. And Justin does that because once Justin gets thousands of traders together doing that, and he has built a business on the back of this over the years, once Justin gets thousands of traders doing this, Justin gets paid a small amount, you get paid a larger amount, your transaction costs go down, you get hooked up to the broker that you is going to fit your needs better, you have somebody to, that you can call when your broker engages in some kind of crazy shenanigans, and you, you might say, well, where's the catch? Well, the catch is the money is going to you <laughs> and a little bit to Justin instead of all to the broker. That's the only catch. That's crazy. But th this business allows for that kind of circumstance to happen. So I introduce every trader I know to Justin. Even if you have an account established somewhere, you, you should talk to Justin and just say, for what I'm doing, is this the right place to be? And it's only going to benefit you. Like You're only going to get some of the money right now that goes only to the broker. You're only going to end up getting some of that back. And some of your clients, Justin, get, I don't know, they, they, make, they make like $700 in rebates or whatever in a month. Oh, we've, we've got clients that make $5,000 a month. Yeah, so you get paid, you, you at least get some of those transaction costs back, which otherwise you're not going to get those back, and you're going to take the same trades anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not in the philanthropy business. We're not in the um, cooking business. We're in the making money business, you and I. And uh, um, as a trader, your job is to make as much money as possible, and every pip saved, is a pip that you don't necessarily have to make in the market. Uh, so take advantage of every advantage that's out there, uh, every opportunity that's out there. And um, we are we are simply aligning our business with yours instead of aligning our business with the brokers. Uh, and uh, we are your ally. So, um, yeah, Rob, you said it very well. Thank you for the endorsement. Uh, it certainly means a lot. And um, I, I know we already have uh, many of your your TFL subscribers as clients, and uh, yeah. uh, all I can do is hope that they uh, refer others, and uh, you know we'll continue to. Uh, yeah, Justin's customers. Yeah, Justin's customers include um, a lot of big names in <laughs> big names in currency trading. My friend uh, Boris Schlossberg is here tonight in the webinar, and Boris is a client of Justin's. Um, uh, so I mean. We're all, you know, once you once you realize this is available to you, we're all on this boat. Like, this is the this is great. Um, a lot of traders asking if specific brokers are involved in the program. This isn't some kind of bait and switch where Justin's only got one dealer. <laughs> Literally, Justin. Let's assume that someone could trade anywhere in the world. How many brokers can you connect people to? Uh, right now, we probably have agreements with about thirty. Um, we can add if we need to, um, but we do a lot of due diligence on our brokers. We try to work with only the ones that are large, stable, reputable, regulated, uh, well capitalized so that uh, our client's money is secure, their dealing is fair uh, and consistent uh, because uh, 
not that we have any control over what a broker does uh, with the client's account and trading, but uh, I always feel like if we send a client someplace and the broker does something underhanded, well, we're guilty by association. And uh, I don't want to ever be guilty by association. So um, there are we try to pick the best of the best, and, um, and I think we have, and, and we do constantly review it. We remove firms from our list. We add new ones that we think are good and worthwhile. Um, and um, we are uh, we are we are doing that um, to to give the best options that we think uh, to our clients. Yeah, uh, Charles here tonight. Charles, I think it's Charles Tongren. Hi, Charles. Charles is saying Justin's a good man and great to work with. And um, are there hey, other Charles, advantages yeah. besides these rebates, Justin? Are there other advantages besides those rebates? We, I think you just talked yes. about them. I mean, you just said it, but you know, you could repeat it again. Yeah, no, listen. Um, one of the things that we we have worked on recently, which I'm very excited about, um, and is actually quite uh, relevant in light of the news that FinFX is no longer accepting U.S. clients as of the end of this month, is that uh, Forest Park uh, is working with uh, ATC brokers um, on a um, basically a joint venture of sorts where. Clients can use the ATC brokers front end MT4, which allows uh, for hedging and is not restricted by FIFO. And at the same time, you can also get rebates in that process. So it's a it's a best of both worlds um, for those that need it for algos or their particular trading strategy. Um, you can now hedge and avoid FIFO and get rebates on your trading, uh, all the while staying with. Uh, a U.S. broker if you need to stay with the U.S. broker. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's awesome. a really interesting thing. Um, we do help clients who uh, want to become money managers, so if you're interested in pursuing that, we can help you with the regulatory process. Uh, we can help you find strategies, money managers that suit your investment profile. Uh, you know, if you realize that, hey, I'd love to be a great trader, but maybe I'm not. Uh, but perhaps I can put my money with someone who is. We can help you through that process as well. Um, at the end of the day, we're a solutions firm. Whatever your particular needs, concerns, or questions are, voice them to us and let us see how we might be able to help you. And uh, we've got a pretty good track record for doing that. Yeah, if you have a if you have a concern or a problem with your broker, Justin knows the people at the broker, gets on the phone. And he can help. Oh, yeah. And he can help you. Yeah, out. that's uh, that's common. That's, that's very common. That's several hours every day of just uh, just tackling trading issues, platform issues, broker issues, um, trying to trying to speed up that process. You can do it all yourself, but you're going to start with the lowest level of customer support at a broker. Yeah. You're often going to get a lot of misdirection and misinformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can streamline that for you. Um, what we try to do ultimately is free you up so that you can focus on trading and we'll handle all the administrative crap that, uh, <laughs> that frustrates you and takes you away from And once that. again, every broker has a spread and every broker has a markup. Some brokers have a commission. You're going to pay that anyway. You're not going to get any of that back. I, I just need to reemphasize that. In exchange for Justin bringing the brokers more business, they give back to Justin a portion of those transaction costs, and then Justin cuts you a check for, the, uh, in some cases, 70% of that transaction cost. It's, it varies between brokers. So Justin gets paid. You get mostly paid. The broker gets the business, and... Um, I, I, it's just a good, and I get to do webinars. I, I love <laughs> traders. I love traders, everybody. I, you don't, you might not know me very well, but this is my life. It's my, it is my mission in life to associate with and improve the lives of traders. And it is unquestionably not easy to explain, but I have been blessed to be a trader, to make my living from trading and to associate with the finest people in the world who take risks every day. And so it has been my goal at a time of uncertainty in the markets when it is very difficult to get a straight answer to a question. It is my pleasure and it's a privilege to bring you someone who can answer your questions and keep this, this whole thing going um, because it's times like this that people who will otherwise make a lot of money one day end up leaving the business because they just don't understand where to get an answer about how risky it is or whatever else it is. So. 
I want to say um, it's time for us to go. If you have an account already at any one of those brokers, Justin can still help you. So whatever you do, don't delay. Make sure you contact Justin. His email address is on the screen right now, and I've put it in the chat window of this webinar. Justin, I want to say thank you on behalf of everyone here, and I know that a lot of people are already typing in the, the chat box that they are getting ready to contact you tomorrow. So I, you'll, get, you'll be hearing from a bunch of traders here tomorrow. Excellent. Well, thanks again, and, and thanks, everyone, for uh, participating. And uh, for those that will be attending your, uh, your expo, Rob, uh, in a couple weeks, uh, I will be there and uh, look forward to meeting as many of you as I can. Okay. So thanks again, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll find a way to work together. Thanks, everybody. Get in touch with Justin, and I will see you very soon. Talk later. Bye for now.